morning to each one of you. What a joy to be in God's presence. But before we start our singing, I'm going to ask you in each of your homes that you would bow your heads, close your eyes, and let us ask God this morning to search our hearts today. As I sing this, this prayer, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be any wickedness in me and cleanse me from all my sins, O Lord, and set me free. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be any wickedness in me, any sin, any anger. Cleanse me, any, any bitterness, any hatred, any jealousy. Remove it, blot it out, O oh Father, that I may lift up holy hands this morning and praise the name of Jesus. Set me free this morning, O oh Lord. Set me free. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. A warm welcome to each one of you as you join us, DBF Central, for this virtual service. Before I sing about the lion and the lamb, praise Adonai is the first song that we have. I'm going to just read something from the Holy Scriptures Revelation. It says, you are worthy to take the scroll. You are worthy to open its seals. For you were slaughtered with your own blood. You purchased a people for God for every tribe and tongue. From every people and nation and made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they will reign on the earth. The slaughtered lamb has now deserved to take the riches and the power to take the wisdom, strength and honor. To take the glory and blessing. The one on the throne and the lamb. To the one on the throne and the lamb and the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Praise Adonai. Let us stand up in our homes this morning and honor God. Stand up from your, your cushions, your sofas this morning and let us sing to the Lord a new song. Of the earth, all the angels and the saints. 
our hands to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. As we bring unto Him a new song this morning. Let us praise the name of Jesus. The name above all names. In Him there's peace, there's joy. There's newness of life. Who is like Him? Lion in the land, seated on the throne. Who is like him? Lion in the land, seated on the throne. Mountains bow down. Mountains bow down. Every ocean roar. Praise that all night. Praise that all night. From the rising of the sun to the end of every day, sing praise and all night. All the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints, sing praise. Are you happy to be in God's presence this morning? What a joy to be with each one of you, although I don't see you, but I know most of you, and I know we are enjoying this time of worship virtually because we love God and we are here to give this day, this day of rest and surrender ourselves to Him, His calling, His will, and His purpose. I'm going to hand this time to our brother Vernon. He takes this forward. I was buried beneath my shame. Come on, put your hands together. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my turn till I met you I need a rescue, my 
my sin was heavy with chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when I was broken you were my healing now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future my eyes are open is when you call my name I believe he holds us in his hands. It's probably the last time uh, I'm leading worship with our dear friend, my sister-in-law, Emily. She's going to be up with Sharon next week, but with me, I think this is the last time. But uh, she's going to sing this beautiful song. We've sung it over and over again. In your hands. And as uh, this family goes back, this song is a promise to you, Emily, and the family that he will hold you, Sandeep and the children, in his hands.
cross I bow my knee at the cross do I come Lord this morning
Lord, for giving your very own precious son, Jesus, to die. So that, oh Father, we have a hope, a future. We have forgiveness, oh Father. And we thank you, Lord, for grace, Lord, that you've had upon us, oh Father. May we respect that grace, oh Father. May we be grateful, oh Father. May we not treat grace cheaply, oh Father. May we, Lord, think of that big sacrifice on your cross, oh Father. And that blood, oh Father, you shed for us, Lord. We celebrate, Lord, today that you are risen, Lord, on high, oh Father. And you are seated at the right hand of the Father. And we glorify you, oh Father, because you are King of kings, Lord of lords, Lion and the Lamb. Bless your name. And all God's people say, Amen. Good morning once again, DBF Central, and again on from my side, I know it, Danny's already said this, but thank you for bearing with us, thank you for uh, just bearing with us through that little bit of an uh, electrical glitch over here at the center. Uh, I've been here many years and we've seen many things, we've seen all kinds of different uh, fun activities that happen during the worship time, and the devil doesn't like when we lift up the name of Jesus, when we are worshiping God, and he tries all his little stunts to distract and to discourage us. So thank you for bearing with us. Thank you so many of you who were praying uh, for this morning service. And here we are again, uh, worshiping God together. So allow me to pray for us, even as we look into God's word together as his family today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the honor it is to be able to come to your presence, to be able to open your word and to know that the God of the universe, who could be so incredibly busy, would speak to us. The God who holds the stars and the moon and the sun and everything in His hands, that He would speak to us. Lord Jesus, in all Your majesty and glory, that You would promise that when we gather, You will be there. Oh Father, what a, what a luxury and what a joy it is to be able to claim that promise and to know that You are not only here, but that You are here to speak. You are here to change and to challenge us. So speak to us, Lord, from Your Word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've been following with us over the last few weeks, we've been in a study in the book of Jude. Uh, and, and today we, we come to the end, the last part of that study. It was a three-part study. Uh, and we come to the last part of this letter. It's a one-chapter letter, very easy to read. Uh, so you can read it at home for yourself. Uh, and you can follow along in case you missed the previous sermons. You can uh, find them on our YouTube page. And you can follow along as to what we've done so far. But as Jude brings his letter to a close, in conclusion, he offers a doxology. Uh, and basically, it's a statement of God's glory that he chooses to use to bring his letter to a close. 
And this is what it says in verse 24 and 25. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And that's how he ends this wonderful letter, this this. Uh, this heavy letter in one chapter it packs a pretty powerful punch he's talked about false teachers and he's talked about just God's anger towards that and he's warned us about uh, about these false teachers and he's challenged the church to put alarm bells in place for themselves to make sure they don't go down a wrong path and to make sure that men like this don't creep in to your gatherings and become people of influence and then last week we looked at how he talked, uh, how he challenges us in times like this where uh, truth is on the decline or a love for truth is on the decline and a love for lies and the space that, uh, that lies has in our society is on the rise. He says, how do you respond to that? And he gives us three things last week and we looked at that. And this week he brings his letter to a close. And so you can't read the doxology, this, this concluding remark of his, outside of the context of everything else he said. It is very much within that context that it fits. And in this doxology is some heavy theology as well, some heavy teaching as well. What you're going to find is that he makes a two-part promise or he tells us of a two-part promise from God that is based on the person of God and the power of God. It's a two-part promise based on God's person and God's power. So he says, let's get into it. He says in the beginning, in the first phrase, verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Now who is this? It goes on to tell you, the only God, our Savior. And so he's talking about God the Father. He says, to, to God the Father who is able to keep you from stumbling. And this, this theme of keeping is there throughout the book of Jude. Right in the beginning, in verse 1, it says to those who are called, beloved in, the, in God, the Father, and kept. And they are kept for Jesus Christ. And then last week, we looked at how he tells us to keep ourselves in the love of God. And now in his ending, in his conclusion, he says to the one who is able to keep you from stumbling. And so the first promise you have, or the first part of this promise that you have from God, this assurance that we get from God is that He is able to keep us from stumbling, from falling in this faith walk with Him. For all the warnings that Jude gave us, for all the things that he said about the way of Cain or the error of Balaam or the, or the arrogance or the rebellion of Korah, as we looked at that two weeks ago, as we looked at last week where we said we should secure ourselves, secure others and, and you know, not get caught up in sin along the way. Now he says to God, who is, he is the one who is able to keep us, to keep you from stumbling. And the original word, as you look at the word, that idea of keep you, it's not merely that you don't fall. It's, it's not merely that. But it's an idea of the one who is able to guard you so that you stand firm. So that you stand, you don't waver in this faith walk. Oh, but pastor, you know, I love Jesus. I love Jesus and, and I want to follow him, but I fall. So is God a liar? Because let's be honest, you've sinned. After loving Jesus, after proclaiming him as Lord and Savior, you've sinned. Sometimes Sunday morning is a wonderful worship experience, but by Sunday evening, you've fallen in that same old pattern. I've been there. So what? Does the reality discount our theology? Are we to read this and then look at our life and say, Oh, but you know, but God didn't keep me from stumbling. I kind of tripped and, and fell this week itself. So is God a liar? No, my brother, my sister, you, you have to read what he's saying. He's saying to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. I am able as an earthly father to provide for my children. I am able to protect my children. I am able to love my children. But if they walk away, if they walk away from my protection, from my care, from my relationship, if they choose to walk a different path, if they choose to move away, if they choose to live Monday to Saturday far away from me, then Monday to Saturday, I, I'm not there. To, if they come to me, I'm able to do it. 
If they will choose to walk with me, I'm able to do it. And that's why last week is so important. Secure yourselves in the faith. Keep yourselves in the love of God. You can't absolve yourself of the responsibility because, you know, God has promised he'll keep me from stumbling. Or even Psalm 121 says, you know, he'll, he'll watch over you. The sun won't harm you by day nor the moon by night. He will never let your foot slip. But I slipped. It's God's fault. It's God's fault when I fall in sin. He, you know, he should have been watching for me. You know, James says, don't blame God when you get tempted. James chapter 1. Don't blame God when you get tempted. Expect it. You're a sinful person. Don't go around pretending you're not. I can't walk around saying, oh, it'll never happen. I won't do it. Whatever happens, I won't do. Expect it. Agree with God that you and I are fallen and sinful and weak. Don't pretend. And then in our weakness, we will cling to his strength. In our weakness, as we acknowledge that we are weak, as we acknowledge that we, are, we have a desire within us to sin, we will cling to God's presence. We will yearn for the safety of his presence. And when you run to him, the promise, the assurance that he gives you is he says, I am able to keep you from stumbling. So run to me. It's an invitation to run to God. It's an invitation to walk close to him. It's an invitation to hold on to his hand as you cross the road because he is able to keep you from getting run over. He loves you and is able to keep you from being run over. So hold his hand. Hold his hand and move with him. That's the first part of the promise. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. And the second thing that God says that I am able to do for you, I am able to present you blameless. Where? Not blameless in your office. Not blameless in your school. But blameless in his holy courtroom. A courtroom that decides on what is sin and what is not sin. A courtroom that decides on eternity of your soul. In that courtroom, God says, I am able to present you blameless. Now, you have to understand the madness of that promise. The sheer craziness of that promise. Because, you know, we, we love to compare ourselves to others and we feel good. You know, I... I I'm better than that other person. You know, sure, I do this and that. I'm weak. I, yeah, I'm, I'm also fallen. But I, at least I get up quicker. At least my sin is not as bad as that. And I feel good. I kind of pet my ego by doing that. And I, and I feel good about my holiness. But if you had to be honest and if you had to be true and, and, and you had to tell the truth, then you have to, uh, you have to confess that you are not blameless. You might be better than somebody else. You might be, you know, you might get up quicker from sin. You might repent quicker than others. But you're not blameless. And you've never done, and I've never done anything in my life to warrant being called blameless. Blamelessness is different from degrees of sin. Blameless means spotless. As if you never sinned. God said, he says, I will present you blameless. It is a ridiculous and mind-blowing promise that God gives you. It's, it, it boggles the mind. And it's not that God says, you know, I, I'll call you to a corner room somewhere where nobody can question. And in a quiet corner where nobody is looking, I'll be like, don't worry, you're blameless. Uh, between you and me, you know, we're cool. It's not that God says, I will present you blameless in my presence in that big glorious heaven that he has. There'll be an audience over there. There'll be all those that know your messiness, that know my messiness. As you stand before God, you, you, know, you stand there and God says, this person is blameless. And in that audience, maybe there's an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girlfriend or an ex-colleague or a boss who will be like, wait, what? Blameless? Wait, wait, hold my beer. And he'll get up. Don't worry, there's no beer over here. It's just a modern pop culture reference. But they'll be like, blameless? Let me tell you what he's done. <laughs> God, were you busy, you know, trying to deal with politics or politicians somewhere when, when he snuck a sin in? Let me tell you what he did. And if they don't want to do it because, you know, they're dumbfounded in the glory, pres glorious presence of God, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He will get up. That's what he loves doing. He'll be like, blameless. Wait, wait. He? Blameless? 
Not only is he not blameless, he is far from it. It's not like he just committed one sin. But God says, I am the judge. I am the judge. The father is your judge. And the son, your advocate. And they'll stand. The triune God of heaven will stand and declare us blameless. He has the ability. But again, you need to walk with him. You need to love him. You need to pursue that intimate relationship with him. You need to not cheap, cheapen the grace that allows him to do that. Which is what he accuses, Jude accuses the false teachers of doing. Of using the grace of God as an excuse for sensuality in their life. You can't use the grace of God for that. If you misuse the grace of God, if you think, oh God loves me so he'll forgive me. If you want to play that game, you've not understood the love of God. You and I, we have to walk with him and he is able and that's an invitation. He says, come to me, walk with me. I am able to keep you from stumbling in this faith walk. I am able at the end of it all, when you finish with the faith walk, I am able to then present you blameless in my courtroom, the only courtroom that matters. Mind-blowing and wonderful promises. But you see, a promise is only as good as the promise keeper. Or the promise maker, sorry. I remember when I was growing up, my father used to uh, help out in this uh, a little center that uh, was helping with rehabilitation of drug and, and alcoholic addicts. Okay, they were alcohol addicts. He was helping out a lot over there. And so we had a steady crop of, of some of the people from there who loved our, our home when we grew up because it was an open home. They would come and hang out at our house a lot. And there was this one uh, particular uncle who, you know, was very close to us as a family. He, uh, came, uh, at least he came often to our house. And uh, there was a time before my birthday, about a few weeks before my birthday, where he walked in and he's like, what do you want for your birthday? Tell me, whatever. And I was about... I think six or seven, and for some reason I decided carpentry, that I was going to be a carpenter when I grew up. And so I told him, I, I want a carpentry set. And I told him all the little things that make a carpentry set, and he's like, done. Your birthday, that's what you're getting, carpentry set. Uncle will give it to you for sure. And my birthday came. And then the next year also it came. And I waited for about four years for the carpentry set. And my mom and dad had to tell me, like, yeah, yeah. he probably had something before coming and before making that promise to you. He was not in his senses. He made a promise that he can't keep. He barely has money. He's staying in this rehab center. He has nothing of his own. We are giving him food when he comes home. He has nothing. He has nothing to buy you anything with. You're not getting anything. Give up on that carpentry set. It's never coming. Now I'm 40 and it's never come. But a promise is only as good as the one who makes the promise. If he doesn't have the ability, then he can't come good on it. And if he doesn't have the love, he can't make the promise in the first place. And so Jude tells us that these amazing promises of God are based not on your performance alone, but it's based on the person and the power of God. And that's why he goes on to say, to the only God, to the only God, our Savior, a few things about that phrase. The first is this. He's only, he's the only God in heaven. There's no competition. So you serve him, you walk before him and you've got these promises. He'll keep me from stumbling. And when I get there, when I get to heaven, he's promised to present me blameless. And then you finally get there and the God is standing over there. He's like, oh yeah, that guy. Yeah, no, I, I usurped him. I threw him. I overthrew him. Now I'm God and I didn't make that promise to you. That's not going to happen because there's no power struggle in heaven for the throne. He is the only God. It will never change. And so his promises are forever. It's not like some other faith systems where suddenly one is higher, suddenly the other is higher. In that day and age, the Greek mythology and religion was prominent when Jude was writing. And in Greek religion, you had power struggles over who was the chief in heaven. And they were always fighting for who would be in control. It's not the case. Jude says, no, there's nobody up there besides him. He is the only God on the throne. And so if he says it, it's going to get done. 
He's the only God. There's no power struggle. But then it goes on to say, this only God, this amazing God, this powerful God, He is our Savior. He has chosen to be our Savior. See, under no compulsion, there was no emotional blackmail involved in this. And it's not even that God saw the pitiful condition of us in sin and then decided to be our Savior because Scripture clearly tells us before be time began, before creation, before all of that, God already had worked our salvation. He had already set His affection upon us, His creation. He is a loving God. Not because you and I are lovable, but because He is a loving God. And His love is not just about sitting in heaven and throwing us a bit of pittance here and there. Sure, we bask in His love and grace towards us. This morning, it is by the love and the grace of God that the power came back on and we can do this. It is by the love and grace of God that we have a media team in our church that has brought us through this lockdown with live streaming facilities. It is the love and grace of God that preserves our life here, but it is also the love and grace of God that has called some home to His eternal glory. He is a loving God. And all of these things are His acts of love, but the greatest act of His love is in Him planning the great salvation that He has planned for us. Of all the titles that he could have chosen, he chooses to be our savior. And if you look, and if you're following as an academic mind, then you'd ask the question, wait, but isn't Jesus our savior? Pastor, didn't you say that the word God refers to father in this? You know, that's why I love you all. You ask these questions. Jesus is our savior. He is the means of our salvation because of the cross that Jesus endured on our behalf. But the salvation plan is sourced in the Father. Because Jesus himself said in John's Gospel, John records for us where Jesus says, I can do nothing unless the Father tells me to. And so it is by the will and the design of the Father in heaven and that salvation is permitted for us. He is the Savior. He is the source of our salvation. If He abandoned the Son at the cross and said, no, actually, you know, I changed my mind, it was all for naught. If He, just before Jesus came to be born, if the Father said, listen, actually, let's just not do this, it would have been over. And you and I would have been left languishing in our sin. The Father is where salvation originates. It's not that the Father is this judgmental, angry God of the Old Testament and the Son is the nice, the loving one who came down for us. Jesus did not twist the arm of the Father in heaven and said, look, but they're so nice. Let's, let, okay, let me go and save. There's nothing of the sort. Jesus says, unless the Father says it, I can do nothing. And the Father said, go, let's save them. The only God, our Savior, the loving Father in heaven. How did He do it for us? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Jesus Christ, our Master. He sent the Son down and He said, okay, you go. You be the firstborn of this new creation. You lead them in that triumphant procession. You take all glory for yourself. Oh, but, but pastor, then what about the Father in heaven? Yeah, the Bible tells you Jesus will do this. He'll bring all glory to himself and the Father will let him do that. And he'll make the whole world his footstool and he'll beautify his bride for himself. He'll take all the glory and then he'll give it to the Father. The Bible tells you the plan already it's like a almost like a bad movie trailer it's told you the ending already that's what jesus will do there is no competition in heaven jesus is not sitting there going oh but i did everything so you know why don't there's nothing of the sort in perfect love from heaven the salvation plan 
was made affordable to us. Not because of us, because of them. Because of the triune God of heaven that has loved us. Beginning from the Father, seen in the cross of the Son, and experienced today in the presence of the Spirit. So God is loving. And He's able to make the promise to us out of His love. But again, can He keep the promise? My dad loves me. And so he'll make promises to me. But then there are times when even if he promises, you know, like, like you know, our family is planning to move to England. If my dad promises, son, uh, be promised, we'll come visit you. It's a promise that as far as he's capable of, he will keep. But he's not capable of all the different new moving factors of his life. There could be a second pandemic next year. I hope not. But there could be. But God is not stuck by all these things. He goes on to say, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. Basically, God is all in all. Everything belongs to Him. And it's not that you and I, and it's not that Jude is saying we should give it to Him. Because it's not ours to give. You don't have dominion and authority. You barely have dominion and authority over your life. If you did, you would have got up earlier this morning and done the exercise that you promised yourself you would. We barely have control over ourselves. That's why we said, you know, we keep stumbling. We need to run to somebody who can keep us from stumbling. So authority, dominion, wisdom, power and strength is not yours to give to God. And anyway, the time frame that Jude paints for us is before you were here. Because it says, before all time, you came about maximum in this congregation 90 years ago, maybe, some of you. For the most part, 40 to 50 years ago. But Jude says, before all time, now and even forever, God, you are all in all. You are sovereign. You are all powerful. You have all the authority. You have all the dominion. You have all the glory. It's all yours. It is all yours. It has always been yours. And it will forever always be yours. God, you are everything. And so we find that God has the love in his heart to make these promises towards us. But he is also the authority of heaven that can keep this promise towards us. And so at the end of talking about all the false prophets, about all the ways you could fall, giving us all those warnings, telling us, listen, secure yourself, go out and secure others. At the end of all of that, Jude says to you and to me, he says, while you do all that, God has promised and he has invited you, he's calling you through his promise, come to me. Walk with me because I'm loving enough to promise you that I will keep you from stumbling. I'm loving enough to promise that I will present you blameless in my glorious courtroom. And I'm powerful enough to come good on that promise, as I have said. When you read this and you understand this, you begin to understand only a fragment still of the power of 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1 where John says, How great the love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. How great indeed the love that he has poured out in abundance over us in all his authority and yet all his mercy. So as we bring this series to a close, allow me to read that doxology to us again as the benediction for this service. I want to give you a moment in quietness to pray in your heart. And then we'll read this as our benediction for this service. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling 
and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever amen God bless you thank you once again for bearing with us this morning the service will obviously be in two parts on the YouTube channel the beginning part of the service before the lights went and the second part after the lights came back do watch them if you tuned in a bit late don't don't miss the beginning part as well there's some amazing worship at the start as well thank you for joining with us thank you for bearing with us we'll see you again next Sunday uh, as we uh, as we have a special service and a standalone sermon uh, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel don't forget to follow us on social media and in case you're wondering about uh, the payment of your tithes and your offerings the link is given in the description of this video uh, do do be faithful in your giving of your tithes and offerings before God God bless you